and welcome to this flipping fibromyalgia question and answer, which is a follow up to the live event in April, which you can find on our YouTube channel. My name's Louise Chewern. I'm the lead lift experience trainer at Live Well With Pain and a keen ambassador for flipping pain. We didn't have time to squeeze in all your questions, so we will do our best to answer as many as we can today. Flipping Pain is a public health campaign aimed at improving understanding of persistent pain, and this was our very first and much, much requested event focused entirely on fibromyalgia. And we are delivering this event in partnership with a fantastic charity for people affected by persistent pain, pain concern, and on behalf of in association with the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland. I'd like to introduce our panel. We have Ian McGahey, who has lived experience of fibromyalgia, Maureen Menzies, who also has lived experience of fibromyalgia, Dr Barbara Phipps and Professor Cormac Ryan. And we'll move on to our questions. So question one, can you explain potential causes for fibromyalgia? I think Cormac, we were going to come to you for that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here with, with that one, Louise. Uh, it, it's a really good question, and it's one that everyone wants to know. Everyone wants this particular question answered. And there, it, 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 unfortunately, the answer is, is, is not straightforward. It never is, I guess. There, there are lots of things that are associated with uh, developing fibromyalgia. But just because something is associated with it, it does not necessarily mean that it's causal, that it causes the development of fibromyalgia. And I, 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 there's, there's no clear evidence around um, causes. However, to think about the things that, that are associated with it, um, so a history of things like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. These are all things that are associated with the development of fibromyalgia. Being a, a, a female, um, having a slightly a higher BMI, having um, um, not progressed as far, too far in, in, in sort of higher education, etc. These are all things associated with. But as I say, it's it it's important that people don't see those as causal. They're just things associated with. So to answer your question, long story short, Louise, there is, it's, it's we can't necessarily see things caught, but there are a number of things associated with it, uh, um, uh, such as the things I've just mentioned. And I'm gonna quickly add on there that I think there is some evidence that it can run in families as well, isn't there? I don't know that it's exclusively, but I think there's some evidence um, there, there, there will. Um, I guess that's that, that's something I'm not going to say outright because I I, I can't call that to mind no. directly. So I, I I don't want to say yes or no when I don't it know. It isn't but always the case. One would assume there will be some form of familial link mm. to it. Thank you and. Question two, is there a link with FMS and other long-term conditions such as long COVID, FND, Raynaud's and diabetes? Who, who wants to answer that? <laughs> Maybe I can come in just for a wee bit in this one. And I don't know if I'm going to answer what the links are, but what I have found is anytime I go to the GP, who I also have to say are really supportive, we find that the symptoms of fibromyalgia are very, very similar to the symptoms of other things. So because I have um, an underactive thyroid, there are many symptoms similar to, to my fibromyalgia, the same with my osteoarthritis. So uh, the question is, is there a link? And I, I don't know if there's a link, but I think for a lot of people, the confusion will be that there are such similarities, even in long COVID, 
Mm. A lot of the similarity, a lot of the symptoms of long COVID mimic the symptoms of certainly my fibromyalgia. And and I know everybody's fibromyalgia can be different, but I think that's where there's confusion about links, if, if that makes sense. Mm. And I think, thank you, Maureen. And I think um, for myself, that's why it took me so long to get a diagnosis because they were che checking for a lot of other things um, that were ruled out before they arrived at the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, which I think is common. Yeah, because um, I know I went through a lot of tests, like was it lupus? Was it was mm. it all sorts? So they all had to be cancelled out, if you like, to come mm. to. Like you, Louise, it took years for me to get an, a, a diagnosis. Mm. So I think the link question can be confusing for people. Was it the same for you, Ian? Yeah, it took a long time to get the diagnosis. And it was again a process of elimination um, mm. because the, the, you know the, the, there isn't a confirmative test for fibromyalgia. You can't take a blood sample and say there it is. You've got fibromyalgia, so it, it, it can it makes a confusion. And you know again, as Maureen says, you know uh, there's a lot of different signs and symptoms with fibromyalgia, and it must you know it must be very very difficult for the clinicians you know, mm. to get again the association. Thank you Thank for you. that. Um, so uh, question, question three. three, people tell us all the time that all that symptoms are symptoms put are down to fibromyalgia. fibromyalgia. How do you work out? Is it part of fibromyalgia or is it something different? And does it matter in terms of management slash treatment? wants to take that I can well I, I don't know whether I can but um, maybe it's better <laughs> from one of the lived experience but it's for, it's for speaking from a GP kind of point of view and I think it's it can be difficult you know Ian I really appreciate you saying it can be really difficult for the clinicians um because there's a lot of different symptoms aren't aren't there with fibromyalgia um as, as a clinician what I would do um if you come in to see me is I would always look to make sure that we're ruling out um, anything new um, so before you would then naturally say oh you know this is this is likely to be your fibromyalgia it's always going to be there you know as a, a possibility but I think you've just got to listen to the story um, because people want to be listened to and you have to take this seriously um, and make sure you do the right investigations to, to exclude anything else and then you can confidently say actually I, I do think this is your fibromyalgia and I suspect maybe that's not always people's experience um, but as a clinician I would like to think that that's the best way to practice. Mm. It's the best way. Barbara says absolutely right and I have found a way around um, going to my GPs because I know now that a lot of my symptoms could be something else. Mm. So usually when I go to the GP, because I think probably like many GP practices, there's lots of different GPs and you don't always see the same GP every time you go. And it must be difficult for the GP to be reading all the notes for everybody before you know they, they come in for their appointment. So I usually start by saying, um, here's what's really troubling me. I know it could be my thyroid I know it could be my fibromyalgia I know because I, I think I'm trying to give the GP a heads up to, mm. to, to kind of um, make the appointment not too long but at least we can focus on the symptom that I have and I found that the GP will say right well it doesn't really matter whether it's that that or that let's deal with what's what's actually wrong with you and I find that really helpful Thank you, Maureen. Poor Matt, did you want to come in there? I was just going to follow up on what Maureen said there. I think it's a beautiful example of what we call health literacy. Um, health literacy is is can be about understanding, being able to, to read at a certain level and, 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 and being able to follow like instructions on medications. But it, it, there's a lot more to it than that. 
Um, it's very much aligned with what Flip and Pain is about, which is trying to give people all the information they need, help them to understand the condition so that they themselves can make more informed choices about their own care. But there's a, an additional element to that, and that's about how you interact with others, including healthcare professionals. Uh, uh, part of health literacy is learning how to dance, how to do that dance, mm -hmm. and how to uh, get the most out of that interaction. So more interaction. And Maureen was like, you know, she, she's going in prepared. She's going in having thought beforehand, okay, what do I really want to know? What are the likely questions that my healthcare professional might ask me? Um, and if you're thinking, well, I want to know if this is different to my fibromyalgia, how can I communicate that in a really nice, clear way? So there's that almost that preparation work before you go in. And I think that really increases the chances that you'll come out satisfied and your GP or healthcare professional will also be satisfied because they'll they'll it, you will have helped them to get to the nub of the issue for you more 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 quickly and satisfactorily. I would I would say. I would absolutely agree. I think that's really well put, Cormac, and absolutely, Maureen. I, I think what you your sort of approach to that is is absolutely spot on. So I think sharing that with everyone's really helpful. Mm. Ian. Yep, um, I, I'm in the probably slightly unique position of n knowing both sides. You know, I, I was a clinician, okay, a vet, but you know, <laughs> still understand, <laughs> still understand the process uh, with it. Um, and it, it, it is right, you know, I, you know, was obviously informed if, if I'm going on mastermind, my specialist subjects fibromyalgia. <laughs> so, um, but 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 to, but to is right, and one of the things I always gave, you know, with with my clients was the thing: see if you understand what's happening. You can cope with anything. It's uncertainty. It's it's when you don't know and you're not confident about what's going on that's the that's the thing that eats away at your insides that's the the pain that's the you know the suffering and, and it is pain and suffering and if you can take that uncertainty away then you reduce the pain and suffering mm. and it's a great thing with it and i i had to give a wee talk and, and it, to the eternal credit you know of gp practice you know they got me to give a talk on fibromyalgia and my first slide was fibromyalgia is real yes it's really real <laughs> was, the, was the next line you know and and that that's important and as far as you know dealing with health everybody's human which means that uh, each person's exactly different from the person next to them. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have different strengths and beliefs. And the thing is, is to, you know, to get somebody that you can communicate with and, and you know, and as much as you can. I know GP practices are stacked. At, you know, I know how hard it is, you know, but if you can make the effort, you know, to see somebody and wait a wee bit longer to see somebody that has their appreciation. And I think that's so, so important. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks for that, Ian. And I think as well, I, I would also urge that where possible, clinicians need to look at us as a whole other, rather than just one individual symptom, because I think for some of us, and certainly including myself, if you fall into the trap of looking at the individual symptoms, you can medicate that symptom, but then overall it becomes a much more complicated picture. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for, for looking at us as a whole, especially people with fibromyalgia and similar conditions, because it isn't always just that one thing, is it? No. Um, and it is. I don't envy any clinicians actually I, I don't looking at looking at fibromyalgia. Um, okay, so let's move on to question four. Why does cold weather make my fibromyalgia worse? 
Who'd like to have a go at that? Not me. <laughs> Cormac, have you got any scientific I, answers for us? I, I'm not sure I'm overly excited about answering that question either. <laughs> Only to say that the weather appears to uh, influence pain. Um, um, both anecdotally and there's some scientific evidence to support the idea that pain symptoms uh, um, are influenced by uh, um, the weather, especially the cold uh, uh, um, seems to be a, a, a key thing. Um, as, as to why, I'm, 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 I'm less certain. Um, uh, one could always hypothesize uh, um, that I think bad weather does not necessarily help mood. There are conditions such as um, um, seasonal affective disorder, for example, where, where people are, their mood is lower in, in, in poorer weather. Um, and we know that everything matters when it comes to pain, as is one of our key messages in Flip and yeah. Pain. And um, Mood is one of those things that absolutely matters. Um, so that might be an indirect way by which weather influences. Um, but again, that's the nature of, of, of fibromyalgia and the nature of chronic pain. Lots of things are associated with it. Lots of things seem to influence, but that's very different to causing, you know. Uh, um, but yeah, that, 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 that's my best answer of what is a really good question. Because uh, um. I don't think it's as, as cut and dry as we think, because I used to think it was simply the cold that made my pain worse. But now I swim in the sea all year round. And, you know, I can tolerate the cold in the sea. In fact, I'd say I crave it. You know, it's that buzz that, that you get from it that makes me feel good all day long. But... Yeah. I can't get the same effect from a cold shower and I can't bear to sit in a draft. That cold does hurt. So, yeah, I think it's a little absolutely. bit more complicated. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting, is it? Because is it actually not? Is it is it the meaning we attach to the cold? Mm. So you're going in, Louise, to do your lovely outdoor swimming and that's something that you want to do and it's pleasurable. So you're presumably then your nervous system feels safe. Yeah. And therefore, the you know, that helps your pain. But if you're going out to work and it's a cold, miserable day, you know, and you're feeling really like you're grinding yourself down, then the pain will be worse. I, I think it's sometimes really interesting because um, people will often say that their pain gets better when they go on holiday. And that might be because of the warmth, but it might also just because they're having a really lovely time on holiday. Pressure from work and pressure from home is away. Yeah. So their their whole nervous system just feels much safer. Um, I think there's, and there's, lots, fine flight. there's probably lots of factors, isn't there? Because I know when I was on lots of medication, especially the opioids, I would hide away from the sunshine. I couldn't bear to sit in the sun. The heat also upset me, whereas now I'm not on any of the drugs. I crave it, you know, and I can't get enough sunshine and heat. So I think there's lots of factors that, that, that are at play when we like, when we look at that. Co context is everything. Yeah. Um, uh, we've been talking about it here at a sort of, I guess, a sort of a social and psychological level, but even at a biological level, there are certain um, chemicals in the body that will have one effect mm. under a certain situation and have a completely different effect <laughs> in a different situation. It, mm. it, it Context is so, so important. Important. Yeah. OK, well, I think we did really well with that one. <laughs> so question Surprising five. Me. We did, yeah. <laughs> um, can you explain a bit more about fibro fog and problems with speech, as I can worry it is signs of early dementia? So what about that? I think that's got to be you or uh, or Barbara Cormac. <laughs> well, I can give it a stab, but Cormac, you might need to rescue me. Um, so we did talk a little bit about fibro fog and sort of going down to sort of slightly neuroscience, and I'm no neuroscience scientist, I can assure you, but um, in terms of fibro fog, so my kind of understanding would be that if your brain is in fight or flight, so if the sympathetic nervous system is switched on, you're kind of 
your decision making part of your brain, the sort of higher centres of your brain that make the decisions and improve your cognition are slightly shut down because the part other parts of your brain like the amygdala are just completely switched on and therefore you you can't you just don't have that ability to to sort of make decisions or to think clearly that's my understanding of possible fibro fog and you can rescue me Cormac but well I'll, I'll let Maureen jump in and then I'll have a go after for what it's worth um how would I say this I would never have stopped to think about, Barbara, what you were saying about whether my brain was engaged or not, because for me, it's just, uh, oh, my God, I, I can't get words out. I can't think what I'm trying to say. You know, I've just met me. I've asked your name and now I don't know it. Um, you've just told me something and I've answered it and I now can't even remember what you said and how to answer you back. So for me, there isn't any stopping to think how it's happening or why it's happening it's just having to deal with that it is happening mm. um and i think and i can as i've said before everybody's fibromyalgia is different but for me there's a huge confidence thing then that that comes because if i'm in company I, I think, oh, God, I'll just stand at the side and not really speak to him because I'll forget what they tell me anyway. Um, so I try not to socialise because the, the anxiety of that's worse than the anxiety of not being able to get my words out or not to get my thoughts clear. Um, and I do things, and I said this at the last time, I do try my best to keep my brain active and working, doing quizzes and I read and I do all sorts of things to try and keep myself, mm. if you like, my brain active. But it doesn't really matter. You're either in a fibro fog day or you're not. And I think for me in a fibro fog day, I just have to kind of laugh and go on with it because there is nothing else I can do. Mm. Mm. I, uh, I, after the last recording, uh, Maureen and I had a, a, a brief communication you know, outlining the, the kind of uh, ironic situation that two people suffering from fibro fog were being asked to expound eloquently on fibro fog. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And I think fibro fog is one of those things you can't predict either. You're never sure when it's going to strike. I mean, I, I do quite a bit of public speaking and and sometimes I can be in mid flow I know exactly what I'm going to say and suddenly it's gone um, and you do you do feel a bit silly at the time but I think if people you know most of our our friends and family know that we've we've got fibromyalgia so it's just it's just a case of like you said Maureen don't try and stress too much about it it is what it is and it will pass um, and that's that's mo the most we can do I think. Cormac. Uh, thanks, Louise. Yeah, just to pick up on, on what Maureen said there, um, uh, that first of all, the fact that you, you're doing your, your um, crosswords and Sudokus, etc. Again, I don't know what the evidence is around uh, that reducing brain fog or or improving it in any way shape or form but there are some things that we know are just good for your your health like exercise for example if you it's a good thing to do and though so doing those sort of brain puzzles to keep your brain active and mobile that has to be a good thing to do whether it's improving the brain fog or not keep mm. doing it it's a healthy thing to do. Um, the th next thing I wanted to mention was the uh, disengaging from social networks as a result of the brain fog. That's a, you know, totally understandable thing to do. You can see why it would happen. But again, we know uh, from the literature that social networks are, are so important for general health and for pain. And I, I guess I, I always come back to pain because that's the angle I come at fibro from and I appreciate fibro is so much more than just the pain but it, it's it's the natural angle I gravitate to 
and 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 we know that social networks are really really important that they're, they're, they're an important part of good pain management reconnecting and building those social networks and then the final thing i want to come back to is is the actual question of of how does how does it work um and i i'm going to take the the direction of looking again from from a pain perspective um and so i i i think this is a more of a generic chronic pain thing rather than bespoke to fibro but given how uh, what a key aspect of fibro pain is i think there will have to be some element of this going on here and it's to do with um essentially the idea of dual tasking some of you may or may not have come across this but it's the idea of the more things you are doing the more busy your brain is the less it's able to do other stuff so uh, for example people who um have chronic persistent pain are at increased risk of falling and people aren't fully sure why that's the case but one of the things they think is is to do with dual tasking so if you're you know carrying a tray and you're walking and you're maybe listening to iphone something like that or listening to your ipod um the more things you're doing increase reduces your kind of concentration on staying upright and increases your risk of falling over now it would appear that pain is like another task it's like another thing so if you are holding the tray and walking that's two things if you're holding the tray walking and you've got significant pain that's three things and thus increases your your risk of 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 falling because it just takes use concentration space for something else so my my guess is that there will be an element of that within fibromyalgia though i i don't believe that it will explain explain it in its its entirety at all barbara did you want to add something Oh, I think you're mute. <laughs> Sorry. <Whee! laughs> Sorry. There's always one, isn't there? Um, so I was, thank you, Cormac. I think that was really well explained. Um, I think the other thing that I was going to come back to was um, a sort of almost like context is everything, but it's also, you know, when you get fibro fog, your reaction to that fibro fog. Um, so one thing that Cormac was saying is sort of withdrawing um, from social connections, which obviously isn't help, you know, necessarily that helpful. But I think what you did, you said, Maureen, is you laugh at it. You can laugh at it. And that, again, that lightens the whole mood, doesn't it? It takes away the pressure on the brain. If you, you know, if we're going down to sort of neuroscience or whatever, again, and makes the brain feel safe. If you panic about it, if you really start really worrying about the fibro fog, it's just going to be like pouring fuel onto that fire and make it worse. So I love that you were la you, you sort of laugh again. What you were saying, Louise, if you're doing it, you're doing a talk and, and it, you know, the words just go. And that happens to me all the time. I put it down to menopause. But, you know, <laughs> so I just go, oh, my goodness, everybody is menopause brain. And everybody just laughs. And you think, well, actually, a couple of minutes later and it all comes back to me. Mm. So if I lose concentration or something in this, <laughs> you'll know what's happening. But it's just. I guess that sort of acceptance that that's maybe where you are right now. And actually, that's OK. There's no point panicking about it, you know, panicking about it, because that's just going to make it worse. So lightening it is it's really great. So. Yeah. Cormac, did you have another point or is that an old hand? Oh, that looks like a legacy hand to me. Hold on um, there one second. I'll take it down. Thanks. <laughs> OK, um, so shall we move on to the next one? Uh, is there anything which can help hypersensitivity to noise? I've got my own view on that. And, and I mean, I'll just add it quickly. So for me, uh, I was hypersensitive to absolutely everything when I was on a lot of medication. Um, and once I was able to, I mean, I came off my meds, but I think when people, um, if people are able to reduce 
um, it can help. But I, I don't know if there are other things. And I'll just quickly add that you mustn't do that without consulting your prescriber first. Anybody else got any tips? Um, not not from me, I'm afraid. Barbara, you look like you were no, deep but in I thought. Was deep, I was deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it slightly comes back, and I'll be interested on, on your take on this, guys, um, from a lived experience point of view, but um, would be your reaction to, the, to that again? So if you are, if you're having that really troublesome time and you're just thinking, this is all just too much, then if, if you with the totally you know naturally of course it's going to be really troublesome but if you overly catastrophize about that then that mm -hmm. is likely to make it worse so it's maybe about noticing noticing where you are and then if you're aware that your thoughts are starting to go into catastrophizing which is again completely understandable it's about then bringing that to, trying your best to bring that down um and seeing whether actually if you can just sort of maybe lean into or just do your nice, lovely, deep breathing and calm mm. your central nervous system, whether that might be helpful. Just I wonder if Maureen and Ian, I even now I'm not on the meds. One thing that does still trouble me is if I'm in a room with lots of people talking. So say perhaps in a in um, in a pub or a restaurant or somewhere where there's lots of people talking, I can't keep up with the conversation I'm in because I can't hear it properly. Do, do either of you experience that? Yes, um, just very similar. I'm fine in a, in a room with a few people, mm. but if you put me in a room with lots of people, it's just too difficult, really. Mm. Um, so I find myself tuning out Yeah. Um, because I, I can't take it all in. I used to think it was because my hearing, I used to think it was because I needed hearing aids or something. And I actually went and got my ears tested, but my, my hearing was actually oh. fine. Mm. Um, so that then led me to say, right, well, it is just hypersensitivity. Mm. Um, so I go back to my way of dealing with things and say, right, well, I, I, that's something that will happen. It doesn't happen all the time because I'm not always in a room in that situation. You know, in yeah. that situation. So I know if I'm going into that situation, I'll either go and not wait for long. So I plan how I'll deal with it, if you like, mm -hmm. before I go. And th then I can get I don't get stressed. I can go. I know I've got maybe an hour. I can do what I need to do and then leave. And I just tell people why I'm leaving. I yeah. just say I'm, I need to go. I'm, I'm come for an hour, but it's too difficult for me to cope and to listen to everything. So I'll have an hour with you guys and then I'll just go. And everybody accepts it. But it, mm. it, the first thing is about me accepting it and saying, yeah. this is how I <laughs> deal with it. Because it's more important how I deal with it than anybody else. Yeah. And I think if you add in music and things like that as well into the situation, but I guess. That brings us back to what you were saying, Cormac, about the amount of things the brain is trying to process all at the same time. And it, it's just too much. The more we add in, the more layers there are, the more difficult it becomes. So, yeah. Ian? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going with the, the exact hypersensitivity, but, but, but Barbara is completely right with it. I, I think it's one of the generic tools that you use for dealing with different things, hypersensitivity. I think, you know, with your fibromyalgia, you've got this amount of suffering that's there. And then with additional things, you know, on, on top of it, you know, it makes the suffering much worse. Whilst you might not be able to deal with your core thing, if you can reduce the, the suffering that you can affect, then it's so, so much better. It, it may be enough to, be, to take you from an unbearable suffering back into mm -hmm. coping. And, it, you know, you're not curing your fibromyalgia, but you're making your life uh, livable again. Um, and it's and Barbara's exactly right with it. The skill is in noticing what you're feeling um, and being able to do the process. You know, is feeling this way, is it doing me any good or is it doing me a whole lot of harm? And if you can, and then if it's doing you the harm is, you know, 
Uh, worrying's exactly right. If you identify it's doing you harm and then you stop at doing it, it might be just be enough, you know, for you to cope. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Maureen, did you have another point or is that an old hand? Oh, you're mute. Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to say that even this morning when I was thinking about coming here today and, you know, what, what might come up, and I'm not having a good day today, a bit like Ian, um, so I was a bit weepy this morning, um, and I was thinking, you know, I could cry and cry and cry, and if I cry, I would cry all day and I wouldn't stop, but that doesn't do me any good. So mm. I, I, I've learned to think, right, well, I could cry about this, and I could cry and cry, Oh, and it's not just about the hypersensitivity to noise. It's as Ian said, it's it's actually every symptom of fibromyalgia. So my choice is where do I cry about this or do I live with this and do I find ways to live with it? And I think I, I used the term coping mechanisms and when we first spoke and I think I've become the, the master of coping mechanisms because you have to. Because mm -hmm. if I don't have these coping mechanisms for everything, then I can't survive fibromyalgia. It's as simple yeah. as that. So the only person that can stop me from crying is me. Yeah. You know, the, the GP can't. They can do their best. All the other clinicians can, and they do do their best. But the best has to come from me. But it's, it's OK to reach out in those times, though, as well, isn't oh, it? And absolutely. Reach absolutely. Out for some, yeah, yep. definitely. Yeah. But I know exactly what you mean. Barbara, did you want to come in there? Yeah, thank you. And I, I just want to say thanks to Maureen for, for sharing that. But also just to sort of reflect back to you that you're, you know, you've um, said that you're having a bad day. And yet here you are, Maureen, you've joined us today. On this on this talk, you are contributing. You're helping lots of other people. So I would say to you, there's so many positives for you today that you have. You should be really proud of yourself and take this and think. Actually, it started off as a bad day, but look what I have done, and look how I have helped people, and look what I brought to this discussion today, and that is just phenomenal. So mm. thank you. Yeah, here, here, mm. um, and I'm a big fan of um, reframing things as well where possible and you know so just as Barbara said and and also what's something you said Ian about the suffering I I would sort of suggest that you could change that word um to to another one that doesn't sound quite so bad because I try and do that through through it all because we know it's bad we know it's bad enough but I think sometimes if we can reframe where possible then we can we can also make it a little bit better for ourselves um Cormac have you got something to add yeah thanks Louise and um, yeah I was, I was picking up on both what Ian and, and Maureen were saying there and indeed what you, you you finished with Louise but firstly which was I one of the things I hope people take away from having watched the, the, the talk and the Q&A session, and this Q&A session, is that um, these symptoms are influenced by everything, a variety of different factors. And some of those factors you can influence. And it's about finding those factors that you can influence and, and working on them, uh, uh, um, and, and I hope that this series of sessions empowers people to do just as, as Maureen kind of described there, kind of say, oh, I, actually, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm gonna take this approach because I know actually this approach helps me manage it better. Um, and the second thing I just wanted to raise was around um, this idea of reframing. Mm. the expectation effect it doesn't just apply to fibromyalgia it applies to literally every single health condition that exists um it it, it influences outcome uh, for example individuals as they are aging 
those individuals who start off with a positive mindset of aging don't see it as necessarily a negative thing, but as just a, a normal part of life. Um, they have fewer health related issues as they get older than those who see aging as a, a negative thing that inevitably brings about uh, um, um, health issues. And no one fully understands why that's the case, but the, 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 the predominant theory is that this expectation effect influences how our actual body functions. There's a beautiful study, I love this study, where they compared the effect of wearing Rayburn glasses. I think that's the name of the brand. Are they a really posh type of glasses? Or are they a Ray brand Ban. of... I, I think Rayburn is actually a brand of Aga... Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which, which shows that I really have my finger on the pulse of modern culture. Um, which one is the glasses? Ray-Ban. Ray-Ban. So where they, in the study where they had Ray-Ban glasses versus regular old glasses, but they didn't tell the participants that they were, that they were, they were the same glasses, but just with Ray-Ban etched on them. And the people in the Ray-Ban glasses, they saw better, they performed better on the the um, the eye chart, it, it, it actually made them see better. Just they expected to see better and they saw better. I'm not saying it magically returned sight. I'm just saying it made it made a statistically significant improvement. In their ability to see the, the expectation effect is hugely hugely powerful and it, it it's about as scientific fact as it gets and if you understand that if you know that well then you can think about how you can harness that to make the good days better and the bad days less bad yeah i like that thanks cormac barbara did you have a point yeah, no, I think what you're talking about, Cormac, I mean, I think there's so many studies, aren't there, that have shown similar, and it actually just blows my mind, to be honest. I think the human brain is just crazy and fascinating. Um, but just, I was going to come back to something that you were saying, Louise, which was, you know, whenever you, this was similar to what we were talking about, about the reframing. Um, and I was reading a book, and I think, it, or there maybe is a book that says the brain here's everything you say mm. you know and I absolutely mm. think that that's really true so your brain is listening to everything that you say so a bit like the expectation I'm going to have a bad day your brain hears that and then yeah. you're more likely to have a bad day or actually I might have had a bad start today but I I'm going to have a good day you know so it's just reframing your language a, a bit I think it, it can be really really powerful um yeah I think so. And I mean, I, I, I heard something um, last year, I think it was, um, by a chap that runs an, a, um, a support group online. And he was saying about the noises we make that we don't even realise. So, for instance, I used to, I discovered through listening to him that every time I got up from a chair, I would do the usual, oh, even though it didn't hurt and going up and down the stairs. So I corrected myself and it really made a big difference. I hadn't realised how often I did that, even though it didn't hurt. It was like a, a hangover from when it did hurt. Um, and I, because it became a habit, I still did it. And that expectation was there already for my brain, I imagine, that, that it was going to hurt. So, yeah, these things, I think when we start looking into them, do make quite a bit of sense. Um, so, yeah. A anybody got anything to add before we move on? No? OK, so bri briefly add to that, Louise, just, yeah. just there's there's a, there's always a risk that when we communicate these things online, that someone picks up a sort of the, the wrong end of, of the stick of, of, of what we're saying. 
Mm-hmm. And what I'd hate for someone to, uh, the classic one I find that people leave with after these events is, oh, that, that uh, um, he's saying the pain's all in my head. When, of course, that's the exact opposite mm-hmm. to what uh, uh, we're saying, that uh, we say that the pain is absolutely real. Um, but that one of the things that I think we're, could potentially be misconstrued here is that what we're saying is you just have to think positively and then every day it will be rosy and no. and you know if, if you think oh i'm going to have a good day today you will have a good day and I, I think i guess the point we're trying to make is that everything matters and that if you think i'm going to have a good day it shifts the dial towards it being more likely you will have a good day. It doesn't mean you will, it just shifts the dial in your favor. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's a key thing that I'd like people to, to take away because what could happen is that people begin to think, well, it's, it's my own fault because I just don't think positively enough. Mm-hmm. And that's why, but that's not what we're saying at all. Uh, I think what we're saying is um, this is something that you can, you have a degree of influence over and taking those positive steps can help. I, I'm right in thinking, aren't I, Cormac, that the, the international classification, so the, the, um, the was it IAS, the International Association for the Study of Pain, study of pain yeah. says that pain is what we say it is. Sure, Abs- absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, um, those in the know, those who are, you know, trained specialists in this area, that's absolutely the way we view things. I, I, um, I, I think it's only those who misunderstand pain who do not have a good understanding of it, they're the ones who make those um, p- poor, ill-informed comments uh, that should be banished to the history books, and hopefully yeah. someday will be. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a bit of a big one next. Um, and the question was, fatigue can sometimes feel more overwhelming than the pain how do i manage this um and we have um a prepared answer already from jennifer taggart clinical specialist occupational therapist and so i will just read out what she's put and then perhaps we can have a chat around it um so she's written that similar to persistent pain trying hard to get rid of or lessen the fatigue may bring rise to a constant struggle with the fatigue itself. Rather, what can be helpful is having a more compassionate and open stance and asking the self, how can I do the things in life I want to do all while experiencing fatigue and pain? And here are a few things that can be considered. Really notice the fatigue. You might be thinking, I do notice it. What do you mean notice it? I'm talking about adopting a stance of being open to being inquisitive about the fatigue, even asking the self in any given moment, is my fatigue a more physical, mental or emotional fatigue or a combination? Doing awareness and mindfulness practices can help with this skill of turning inwards to notice internal experiences. Consciously choosing to pause at points in the day to turn inwards and ask the self, what am I noticing right now? Make use of what you notice to help you make decisions around future decisions about what you will, will not do in a day, week or month. Set realistic targets. Pulling back so much and doing very little in life to avoid becoming more fatigued can mean experiencing fatigue at an earlier point than normally would. Pushing through the fatigue and carrying on can lead to overdoing things that can also lead to increased fatigue. The starting point is in finding the balance. Prioritise what matters. 
identify what matters most to you in life that you can't do or no longer do due to pain or fatigue. Prioritizing these things, doing more of what matters in life is linked to improved well-being and quality of life. Maureen, did you want to add something? Yeah, add something. Bless you. Mm. Um, oh, on the fatigue, no, I think I think what you've just read out there, the answer that Jennifer had was, was absolutely right. And I think it 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 it's encouraging because it, it's following that theme of you know recognizing and dealing with, you know, and, and so yeah, absolutely agree with it. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Barbara? Yeah, I thought this was a really lovely answer, actually, from Jennifer. I thought it really encapsulated everything well. And there was a couple of sort of key things, I thought. So the first was about really honing into self-compassion. Mm-hmm. Do you know, and I know that's a bit of an overused buzzword, and, and but it's absolutely true. And we're all really rubbish at it. Like, you know, we all need to, a bit more practice. We, we criticise ourselves so much, much more than we ever would if it was our friends or our loved ones. You know, there's just a constant, like what some people say, the poison parrot on your shoulder that's constantly berating you. So if we can gradually, gradually, you know, sort of push the poison parrot off our shoulder and not listen to it and have a little bit more self-compassion, that's really helpful. Um. See, now you see this is menopause brain. <laughs> I told you, I told you that it would come in. Um, but I think, no, it's come back. The other thing that she was talking about was um, sort of getting into the body, actually noticing what was going on in her body. And it sort of comes back a wee bit to what you were saying, because I think changing the way you think about things and, and thoughts is actually really difficult. You know, it's really, really difficult. Um, so one way of kind of getting around that is actually to start in the body and actually really get to know our bodies. Our bodies are our friends that have been with us since we were born. <laughs> you know, they're our constant companions. So actually really tuning in to what the feelings are, what what are they really like, and getting to understand what our how our bodies are working, what our bodies are telling us. And mm-hmm. um, because most of the communication between our brains and our bodies is actually going from our bodies up to our brains. So if we can change the way our body reacts to a situation. If we can maybe sit with the discomfort or sit with the fatigue and explore it in a mindful way, um, then our heads often follow. But actually changing the body first can be a sort of slightly easier route in, perhaps. Mm. I think it's one we probably all struggle with that we that live with fibromyalgia, excuse me, <clears throat> and that we. Uh, people have said to me, I hate the fatigue more than I do the pain because it stops me doing things and I think the problem and trap that maybe we all fall into as well is berating ourselves when we can't do the things that we did the day or week before and we're awful at comparing well why can't I do what I did last year you know and we really just need to focus on today and what we can yes is that on the shoulder yes you're right Barbara yeah um and I think that's a really good tip Um, is how would you advise a friend if a if a friend said to you you know this is how I'm feeling you wouldn't tell them to for goodness sake pull themselves together and get on with it would you so why do we tell ourselves that and we do it all the time Um, but it is a really tricky one to to manage I think yeah okay Um, so let's move on to another one then Other people tell us that this can change and they struggle to get to sleep. How do you manage that? Not sure if that's come out right, has it? Can we pick the bones out of it? (laughs) Um, Can you say it again, Louise? Well, it may lead on because it is the following question to the fatigue one. Other people tell us this can change and they struggle to get to sleep. How do you manage that? So, so p- p- possibly the question is around sleep. Um, how how do we cope with with sleep when that's the issue? Maureen, 
I've raised my hand for this one because it it's kind of happened to me just very recently. I struggled with fatigue for a long, long time. And yet within about a week, I found I couldn't sleep at all. I just couldn't get to sleep. So instead of having to rest, you know, for a long time during the day and night, I found I was I was going to bed and couldn't sleep. I was waking up at five in the morning. I couldn't get back to sleep. And I couldn't understand why that had just happened. I couldn't think of a trigger or, or anything that would have caused that change. And it was actually quite dramatic. Um, so I thought, God, you know, I'm lying here. And I think... Um, Barbara, we talked about this not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, and Barbara said to me, well, you don't lie in your bed for any more than 15 minutes because that helps the brain to think that it's okay to be lying in your bed and not sleep. So I thought, oh, right, then I have to get up. So <laughs> I would be getting up at five in the morning and going, and, and she also gave me advice to um, do boring things. So I was thinking, right, well, what can I do? So I picked up a book that I had read before. It wasn't a particularly good book, but I thought I'll start reading that again. So I started doing things um, that t t because I couldn't sleep, but then I could then go back to bed and maybe at seven o'clock I could go back and manage to, within that 15-minute period, <laughs> fall asleep again for a wee while. And I'm still in that mode at the moment um, and I've no idea how long that will last but but it has had an impact on my day because you know I've, my day is much longer um, I don't have that fatigue the same so I feel I can do more so I do more and then I'm tired and then I do need a nap just because I'm tired I'm not fatigued but I'm tired um, and then I have more pain. And that, so I'm trying to manage now a new set of symptoms, if you like. Mm. Um, but I just thought I'd come in with that because I, I, I don't know if there's an absolute answer in how do you manage it. But um, I did think that Barbara's advice was good. Um, and I did try it and it did. It does work. Good. That's good. Thank you, Maureen. I'm, I'm so pleased you tried it. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And there are some some good resources online for to help people with sleep and there are different apps and things. But I think, again, like everything else, it's finding the thing that works for you. Not not everything does. Um, I noticed that I missed a question, but I'm not sure if we've got enough time. Should we have a go at answering another one in the time? Uh, this question was, I have issues with continence and IBS. Is this part of fibromyalgia or could it also be linked to menopause? I think that might be. Or Mac or Barbara or. <laughs> <laughs> That just uh, maybe because I'm around that. <laughs> I know what you're going through. Um, that is a really good question, actually. And very much like Cormac was saying earlier, we and you know, IBS is certainly associated with fibromyalgia. Um the continence issue, I know that bladder issues can be associated with fibromyalgia as well. So problems like interstitial cystitis, which gives you that, you know, pain and discomfort in the bladder and needing to go to the toilet frequently. Um, continence, there's so many different causes for, you know, and, and different patterns of incontinence. Um, so it's really difficult to answer that one sort of, um, it's not black and white, you know, that it could be menopause for sure. Um, it could be to do with the pelvic floor. It slightly depends on the the history of the continence and the, the type of incontinence. Um, but certainly the IBS, I could say, would be a, could be easily associated with it. It's it's like everything is not black and white. It's all shades of grey and there's lots of different factors at play. So um, not a sort of very concrete answer. Maureen, did you want to come in? Yes, I did. 
um, because on the last session that we did, um, it, we didn't get to answer this question. And I thought it was incredibly brave of the person who raised this because incontinence is a horrendous, horrendous issue to deal with. And I have I deal with this as well, which made me really keen to have this question answered. I, well, I don't have the answers, but I thought it was really that we should really discuss it for this mm -hmm. person. <clears throat> I, I, I used to have IBS years ago and I managed that through diet and, and I managed it very well through diet and for, for a long time. I didn't have that problem, but recently it, it came back. Now, I think as Cormac said just a few questions ago, fibromyalgia is lots of things, mm. lots of things, and, and IBS or incontinence is one of them. Um, again, I can only talk for myself, and it might be similar to other people with, with um, fibro and with IBS or incontinence, but I find it's not it's not just a bladder issue. It's also a bowel issue, mm -hmm. and that that can be horrendous. Planning for that day is horrendous. Um, you know, I've I've tried the lapiramid and I've tried all of that stuff because if I need to go out, you think, well, I have to go out. How am I going to how am I going to get out? Because you know. I can't stay in the house all the time and it's not the same every day. So I, I think I, I did talk to my GP about it and we did agree that um, lipid wasn't the best use, wasn't the best way to deal with IBS. But we agreed as a short term measure, if I really needed to go out and I was I was suffering that day, then it was a useful tool. But I have been in the situation where, um, you know, I could I could be um, I could be in and out of the toilet ten, twelve times a day. I mm. could be in my living room and not manage the bathroom, and that can happen more than once in a day. Um, it's one of the more horrible sides of fibromyalgia, and it's one of the things we don't like to talk about. You know, it's easy to talk about fatigue and it's easy to talk about the pain. And and I've said before that for me, fibromy fibromyalgia isn't just about the pain. It is about the IBS. It is about the sleep. It is about the pain. It is about the fog. It is about all sorts of things. So kind of going back to Ian's point earlier about, you know, there's all this stuff and then there's this stuff and how do you manage it? I don't know how people will manage that incontinence, but what I can say to them is they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And they need that's to that's important. They're not alone. And and it, you know, and I can say this and I can have a smile on my face, but you know, there used to be a day I used to love buying lovely underwear. I don't buy that now. There's no point because it goes in the bin, you know. So it's it, that's how it can be some days, and that's horrendous for people. But it's important, I think, that we acknowledge it and, and that we, you know, we acknowledge that brave person's um, question. question. I know I might not have answered it for them, but just to let them know they're not alone and reach out to somebody that can help them. Thank you, Maureen. That's really, really, really important. Cormac, did you want to come in there? Yeah, just just very briefly to highlight Maureen's answer. What a brilliant answer. Yes. There's, there's, the, there's the whole point why it's not just me and Barbara here. Uh, because there is only so much that we, our, our, our knowledge is deeply limited uh, uh, by looking from the outside. Uh, 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 and it, that's why the, one of the things I really enjoy about the Flip and Pain campaign is that it is a group effort where mm. the, the the lived experience voice is right there because there there are some things that we just don't know 
and we can't answer well. And then you get Maureen who smashes it out of the park with a brilliant <laughs> answer. Um, because um, one of the things we highlight is the importance of um, connecting uh, 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 and, uh, and being part of a community and social element of it and not feeling isolated or alone. These, these, are, these are things which, 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 which worsen symptoms. And simply knowing that actually, you know that symptom that doesn't get a lot mentioned in, in, in the textbooks? Mm. Actually, there's a number of people also experiencing the same thing. You're not alone. This is actually a, a really common thing. It's not, it's not just you. Uh, and there's other people out there who understand. That's, that's, that's for me, the best answer of, 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 the, of, the, of the day. Um, the only other thing I would add is that um, we can't answer specific individual questions around medical questions because we don't know individuals' histories. We're talking more in general terms for, for, for individuals and groups. But if there is someone out there who has a specific symptom and they're worried about it or concerned about it, then my advice is to take action. Go to a healthcare professional, mm. tell them about that symptom and ask them what they can tell you about it. And what you, I would hope you'll get is compassion and care and listening. And you may not get an answer of this is the problem. But what you should get is I've checked for anything sinister or untoward. And that is not the problem. So you're safe, but these are, but these symptoms are going on. And then at least that should that should give you direction in terms of uh, reducing some of the anxiety and fear and worry and, and, and thinking about then, okay, what can I now do to, to, to manage the situation? So that would be my advice to, to any individual who's sitting thinking, I'm really concerned about symptom X. Thanks, Cormac. I just want to add something as well. We're running out of time, but I just wanted to um, extend a big virtual hug to Maureen because I can see you're, you're quite emotional. Um, and that was a huge thing that you did there, just acknowledging the problems that we have. And, you know, I need to a bit like the Me Too campaign. I have to come out and say that, you know, it's something that I struggle with as well and have done for many years. Um, and recently a friend told me, a clini cl clinical friend told me that about an app that the NHS is promoting called Squeezy. Um, and it's an app for men and for women, and you can download it onto your, your phone and it helps you do some exercises which won't get rid of the problem. But I think like with other areas of fibromyalgia, it's something that, that we can work on a little bit and it has helped me. It hasn't got rid of the problem, but it has helped. So it's worth remembering. Um, and I think that just leaves me now to thank all of our guests Ian and Maureen and Cormac and Barbara for this really extensive question and answer. We still haven't exhausted the list, <laughs> but I think we've done um, a, a really good effort in answering some of the questions that came through. So, yeah. So thank you, everybody. And that's it for today. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.